Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Archie Stonehill. I'm a, an investor with Makers Fund in Europe. Um, and today I'll be giving you a brief talk on introduction to venture capital in interactive entertainment. This is an overview of what we'll be covering today. I'll give you a brief introduction to Makers Fund, who we are, what we do, and also myself. Um, I'll then describe what venture capital is and compare it to some of the other funding models within interactive entertainment. I'll then go into why and how a company would choose to get VC funding, and then we'll finish with a brief discussion of what VCs look for and some advice if you're looking to raise venture capital for your startup. So, first thing is an introduction to Makers Fund and myself. My name is Archie Stonehill, and I'm an investor for Makers Fund, uh, and I cover the European region in general. Um, so Makers Fund is a venture capital fund we invest exclusively in interactive entertainment. Um, so for us, you know, the core of that really is video games as conventionally understood, but it expands outside of that to uh, all of the things that go into making, talking about, distributing games, really anything that kind of touches video games is the core subject. Um, but then also other applications of interactivity to different forms of entertainment. So things that maybe weren't conventionally understood as interactive entertainment, video games, we'll look at. Um, that includes, for example, we're invested in a clip sharing website that um, focuses on games, but we're also invested in companies that look at um, virtual influences. Um, so it's really quite a broad mandate that we have looking at video games and all of the things that have come out of the video game industry. Uh, in terms of the investment stage that we invest at, it's really seed in Series A. Uh, we can go into a bit more what that means uh, later, but uh, for us, that generally means that our investments fall between the range 1 million to 10 million US dollars. That's kind of the size of the check that we write when we back companies. We've been around since kind of 2017, and in that time, we've invested in 50 companies, um, and that's spread across 15 countries. Great. So what is venture capital? Um, venture capital is basically a type of uh, financing, a way for companies to raise money to support their growth and other objectives. Um, and it's a uh, type of financing in which investors, such as Makers Fund, buy a stake of ownership in the companies that they're backing. Now, this is always a minority stake in venture capital. Uh, that means a VC fund buys anywhere from typically 15 to 25%. You do see VC funds that uh, invest for less than that, and also some funds that invest in more, but generally uh, the founders retain most control over the business. Um, now the way VC funds make their money is pretty important to understanding the model. So VC funds raise a fund from other investors, these are called limited partners, um, and then using the money that they've raised, uh, they buy this ownership stake in the companies that they want to back. Now, they don't ask for revenue, they don't ask for any immediate um, return on that investment. The way that VCs make money is that when the companies that they've invested in sell or go public, um, they get a, sh a share of that exit um, based on how much of the company they own. So if I invest in a company and I buy 20% of that company, and then in a few years time, that company sells to another company, then I would get 20% of the value that that company sold for because I own 20% of the company. Um, now, it's important to understand that VCs typically don't get operationally involved in their company. They do support their companies and provide different types of support than, you know, for example, a publisher. But they typically don't do things like marketing or distribution or things that in the video game industry, a lot of developers might have expected from their financial backers 10 to 15 years ago. They typically take a board seat, uh, but they don't normally um, try and take over marketing or take creative control uh, of the companies that they invest in. So this is an, a comparison of VC funds to publishers. Um, uh, generally, I think a lot of people in the games industry are familiar with the publishing model and less familiar with the VC model. Um, now, publishing has obviously been the kind of typical model for um, games to get funded in, in the industry for, for most of its life. 
and VC is a relative newcomer, at least at the scale that it is now within video games. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to compare venture capital funds to publishers. So here you can see that um, one of the key, key differences is that VC funds invest in the company while publishers invest in an individual game. So as a VC, when I um, invest in, in, a, in a company, I'm really um, backing that company across multiple games often um, and not really financing a particular game. I think as a result, VCs and publishers uh, care about slightly different things. Publishers, I think, will look a lot more at the specific projects they're investing in. Um, whereas for VC funds, that's important because it's the most immediate representation of, of what the company will do. But VC funds will care a lot more about things like the team um, and the culture at the company they're investing in, because ultimately um, a company is bigger than any individual project it's working on. Um, and related to that, uh, VC funds therefore invest on a slightly longer timeline. So publishers typically look to get their money back in kind of one to three years, and that's the length of the relationship. Whereas for VC funds, um, it's a much longer term relationship. It can kind of stretch anywhere from three to 10 years. It's not um, atypical for VC funds to be working with a company for five to 10 years. That would be incredibly unusual for a publisher. Um, the return model we'll talk a bit more about on the next couple of pages, but um, as I mentioned in the previous page, VC funds make their money when the company exits, whereas publishers will typically take a revenue share. So they'll say, you know, for whatever you earn off this game, we'll take 10% of that. Now, VCs don't take that. So typically, if you get venture capital investment, you'll be able to keep all of the revenue that you make off the game that you, you develop. Um, <clears throat> Another thing I mentioned is the involvement of the financing partner uh, in the company's day-to-day -day operations. So VC funds, as I said, are purely advisory generally. Um, now, we can discuss a bit more later about what those benefits are, um, but it's perhaps good to think about the things that VCs don't do that publishers might. If you're a mobile game, typically a publisher will conduct user acquisition. Um, if you're a PC or console game, often they'll do distribution. Um, VC funds wouldn't do that. Uh, you generally expect the developer to self-publish if they take VC capital. Um, and related to that is the degree of control that each financing partner has over the companies they invest in. So venture capital funds actually have very little operational control over, over the companies they invest in. Typically, it's um, their, their rights are limited to their own share class. It's quite legal and financial, but it, it's very um, kind of non-operational. Uh, whereas publishers can take um, high levels of creative control over pro um, products. They can you know, request to own the IP, for example. VC funds would very, very rarely do that. Um, and relatedly, uh, uh, VC funds generally have a very high risk tolerance, um, whereas publishers uh, have a low risk tolerance. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that for VC funds, they don't expect to make their money back on every single investment. In fact, VC funds typically expect, you know, over half of their investments to more or less fail. Whereas with publishers, they're really looking for each and every investment they make um, to make money. One of the consequences of that, or perhaps the cause of that, is that VC funds generally make most of their money off one or two really big investments. Um, and as such, whenever we look at an investment as a VC fund, we need to believe at least the possibility that it could be a very, very big company, very successful company. Whereas for publishers, a moderate success is okay as long as they make their money back. That's not really the case for VCs. So many times when I'm speaking to companies, I can look at a business and think it's a good business, they'll make money, they'll be profitable, but it's not what's called a venture backable business because it's not the kind of business that will scale to the extent that it um, that it can can exit at a, at a reasonable um, price for, for us to think it's it's relatively interesting. So that's a, a high level overview of the difference between publishers and, and venture capital funds. Uh, there are of course other differences in terms of how they operate, but I think these are really the key ones to understand how a VC fund works. Uh, this page is a bit of a deep dive into the equity return model, the way that VCs make their money. 
Um, so there's a lot of words in BC that sound a lot more intimidating than they actually are. And one of them is equity. Equity basically just means a portion of ownership. Um, so when I have founder equity there on the page, that's basically the percent of the company that the founder owns. Um, and similarly, the VC equity is just the percent of the company that the venture capital fund owns. Um, so equity gets a value whenever it's sold or bought. Um, so when a company has to raise money, they have to value their equity because if I'm giving you $2 million, I need to know what portion of the company that's buying me. Uh, so in this case, um, the, the company is worth $10 million. Now, it's, it's worth noting that there's actually two ways that people value companies in VC. Uh, the terms are post-money and pre-money. These sound a lot more intimidating and complex than they actually are. Um, it basically just means at what point you are valuing the equity. Um, so uh, the post-money valuation is the valuation after the money that the VC is providing has been added, whereas the pre-money valuation is before the additional money comes in. So in this example, on the left-hand side, you have a $10 million post-money valuation because that's $8 million plus $2 million, whereas you have an $8 million pre-money valuation because it's before the money is added. So what this graph shows is, is an example of what a VC fund would expect to happen to one of its successful investments. Um, it shows the company's value broken down by ownership over time. Um, so the company's value is depicted in what's called a capitalization table or a cap table for short. Um, that really just shows who owns what percentage of the company. Um, so as you can see here, that as the company's valuation grows, so does the value of the equity um, within it. So if I am a VC and I invest now in this company um, and I give them $2 million uh, on a post-money valuation of $10 million, I then own 20% of the company. Uh, if in five years' time uh, that company has scaled up uh, maybe they've gone from pre-revenue to post-revenue, their product is in the market, um, and another company buys them for $100 million. From that $2 million that I invested, I've made an additional $18 million, and I cash out $20 million. So that's a 10 times return, which actually isn't atypical from what a VC would aspire to for any one investment. As I mentioned, VCs generally return most of the fund of a minority of their investments. So in this case, um, this is quite typical of what a VC would hope would happen to a more successful investment. Um, that's kind of an overview of the um, equity uh, of the equity return model. Um, it's really important to understand this, to understand VCs, because you've always got to think when a VC looks at their business, the fundamental question they're asking themselves is how much could this business sell for? So now that we understand how VCs work, I think it's worth exploring how uh, or why companies might want to raise VC capital. So there are common reasons, but um, you know you don't need to, to tick all of the boxes in order to want to raise VC capital. Um, the first few reasons I'm going to discuss are uh, financial reasons that are kind of cash related. Uh, and this is what a lot of people think when they think of VC funds and why you would raise money from them. Um, but the, I think the other reasons are, are very important. Um, so the first one would be pre-revenue funding. If you need product development funding to actually get to the point in which you can support yourself, that's probably the most common reason someone would raise money from a VC fund. Uh, the second one is that so you can accelerate um, your scale up. If there are two competitive companies um, that both are trying to reach a certain scale first, and one of them takes money from a VC and is able to um, you know, reach market two times as fast or expand to two times as many cities, for example, um, that's a significant competitive advantage that a VC can help you uh, attain through financing. Um, the third one, and this is one we see a lot in the games industry, is bringing particular capabilities in-house. I'd say it's a very common story for particular mo particularly mobile studios uh, that they've maybe published a game or two with a third party publisher. Um, and now they're looking for their next game um, to really bring those publishing capabilities in house so that they don't have to give up that revenue share. Uh, so bringing things like user acquisition capabilities or marketing in house 
um, is a very common reason people raise funds from DCs. Um, similarly, kind of the, the, another common, common, common thing we see in the games industry is people wanting to start a second production track or, or expand production lineup. Um, and that might be a reason to raise money. But the last two reasons here listed aren't really finance related, but I still think they're very valuable thinking about. The first one is um, you gain access to um, a network and um, expertise that otherwise might be hard to um, access. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit more in the next page, but certain very valuable VCs bring a lot more than just finance to a company they invest in. Uh, and relatedly, its final reason, um, being venture-backed, which is a term you'll often hear, can lend a lot of credibility and reputation. Uh, this can help with everything from um, developing partnerships with B2B service providers to hiring. It can often be a big stamp of approval that lets people know that you'll be around for a while if you have funding from a top-tier VC. So here I'm going to talk about how you go about getting venture capital investment. Um, it's, it can be a somewhat long and complicated process or a relatively quick and easy one. Um, this can depend on you know, your luck, um, the quality of your pitch, the quality of your company. Uh, but the first thing you'll want to do is uh, find the right DCs. Um, I get a bunch of emails from uh, startups that Makers Fund would never invest in because they're not interactive entertainment startups. So I think that the first thing to do is to uh, figure out whether or not the company you're contacting, um, whether or not that fund would ever actually invest in a company such as yourself. That goes back to the previous page where I was talking about uh, the different ways you might filter VCs. Uh, the second thing is to prepare your materials. Uh, there are a few kind of standard materials that most companies would have when they approach a VC. This includes normally a pitch deck that gives an overview of the company, the team, the ambition, what the product will do. Um, and then if your product's in market or if you have revenue or if you have a large cost structure, you might include kind of key metrics, KPIs uh, or financials. Um, after you've sent those materials, often you'll have a pitch and the VC will conduct what's called due diligence. This is really just an investigation for the um, VC to evaluate your company, look at the, the materials and, and try and figure out whether or not they want to invest in you. Uh, if they decide that they probably do, you'll enter what's called a term sheet negotiation, which is where you'll um, talk about kind of the key components of the terms that you will invest in. Um, so this is often um, valuation or funding amount, but it's also things like um, kind of granular financial uh, control uh, terms. As I mentioned earlier, VCs don't take many uh, control provisions, especially as compared to publishers. But the things they do take kind of guarantee their own rights in general and try and protect the VC's position. Um, but this process can take a while. Term sheets are generally non-binding. Um, but, uh, well, legally at least, but often reputationally, you know, you don't want to renege on a term sheet once you've signed one. Uh, after that, you'll enter legal due diligence and final negotiations where you'll go into much more depth about the terms and the level of control and the, the board composition, things like that. Um, and then after that's all done, you'll, you'll close the deal, you'll sign it. Um, the VC will give you your money and you'll uh, hand over the equity to the VC. So the final thing I'll discuss is what VCs look for. Um, I think that one way to think about it is uh, VCs are always kind of looking at two things. The first is your particular company. How good is your team? Um, how do you fare versus the competition? Uh, what is the ownership structure? This is something I think a lot of founders are surprised by, but VCs generally want the companies they invest in to be founder owned. They don't want, um, an investor to own most of the company. They want the founders to be properly incentivized. But also, if you think back to how VCs make their money, they make money when a company sells. So if there's anything that might get in the way of a company selling, for example, um, they are owned by, they are partially or majority owned by a large strategic in the space, that could interfere with that company getting a good exit. Just to take an example, if you're um, a game studio and you are owned significantly by another kind of large games company, that could mean it's harder for you to be sold to another games company, you get a worse valuation. 
Um, I think on their team, uh, the relevant experience part is quite important. I think because of you know, movies like The Social Network, a lot of founders think they can just you know, drop out of college and found a company. But in general, VCs are really looking for people who have um, done what they want to do at the, at the startup before. Um, the best teams are people who have unique experience in doing what they're trying to do at this startup. Um, that often means you have years of experience designing games at top companies is a, is a big thing that a VC would look for, for example, from a games content company. Um, and then sustainable competitive edge is sometimes hard to describe, but you have to be able to answer why this company in particular um, is going to be able to seize this opportunity, especially as opposed to other companies that are trying to do the same thing, both in the kind of short term, which is how are you gonna to get to the point you want to get to? And then if you think about the long term, how are you gonna protect your profit margins um, from competitors? Uh, and then the second thing that I think, again, a lot of startups and founders don't really think about is the market factors. So you could have the best um, company in the world, but if you don't play in the right market, um, it doesn't matter so much. So I think a good uh, way to think about it is this. Um, if you look at the top playing squash player in the world, um, that person, whoever it is, probably makes less money than you know, the 40 or 50th best tennis player in the world. So it kind of doesn't matter how good you are at what you do if where you're playing gives you a disadvantage. So if you think about whoever the top playing squash player in the world is, when they were however old, five or six, and they decided to pick up a squash racket instead of a tennis racket, um, that instantly capped their potential earnings far more than their natural ability or training did. Um, so I think that just goes to show how where you play is often more important than, than how well you play. So there are a few things that VCs look for when they look at a, the market a company plays in. Uh, the first is that it's a large and growing market. Um, the, the market needs to be large enough for the financial return to be interesting to the VC. I think that's fairly obvious, but what might not be as obvious is that there are clear exit options. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, exits are generally when a company either sells to another company or floats on a public market. And there are certain types of companies that financial investors like more or less than other types of companies. Um, so generally a strategic company, that's a company that kind of, you know, for the games example, it would be another games company. Generally they're gonna invest in companies that they like the team of or they like the IP. There could be a bunch of reasons. But financial investors, people like hedge funds and other public market investors or private equity funds who um, are a, a very frequent exit for many companies that are venture backed, those guys like um, a certain type of company. They typically have relatively re recurring revenues uh, that are easy to forecast. And this is one of the reasons that games hasn't seen much VC interest um, until you know the last 10 years or so. It's that uh, if you look at premium games, pay-to-play games, um, the revenues are what's called quite lumpy. Uh, so this means that a studio will um, spend four years developing a game in which they'll make nothing, then they might release that game and make $200 million that year. Uh, and then they'll go back to making another game from scratch and they'll do the whole thing again. That kind of business model generally isn't very attractive to public market investors. Um, generally, public market investors would prefer a company that makes $50 million each year to one that makes $200 million every four years. Um, that's somewhat related to the scalable revenue potential. Uh, but generally, what I mean there is um, they're looking for companies who can scale their revenues um, exponentially versus their costs. This basically means that companies that are able to grow a lot are generally those that um, their revenues rise faster than their costs. Now, this is almost always the case with games companies because the per game sold cost is normally very minimal as compared to the development cost. Um, so it's not something most games companies or software companies in general have to worry about. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or if you wanna to talk to me about potentially raising money, um, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email there. My email is archie at makersfund.co. Um, always around to answer questions and hope you enjoyed the talk. Thanks so much.